So hello, everyone. It, it is my pleasure to introduce Ryan. Uh, Ryan is an applied research scientist here at Snorkel, and he works on the research team uh, with a focus on applying language models to weak supervision. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ryan. Hey, everyone. Um, welcome to today's ML Whiteboard. So like Roberto said, my name is Ryan Smith, and I'm on the research team here at Snorkel. And today I want to talk to you about prompting methods with language models and some applications they have to weak supervision. Um, so today we're basically going to be using this paper as a template. This is a great survey over some methods and prompting from the last few years from some folks over at Carnegie Mellon. And it's called Pre-Train, Prompt, and Predict, a systematic survey of prompting methods in natural language processing. On top of the paper, they also have a great resource um, as a nice digestible web page that you can go to at pretrain.nlpedia.ai, which I highly recommend. It's got a bunch of the information just distilled really well with a lot of like helpful figures and sectioning for um, some of the more complex topics. But yeah, let's dive right in. So some background. Um, I imagine most of you have heard about the recent advancements in NLP which are basically that we now have these extremely large language models that are trained over a large amount of text over a large amount of time. And then we can use those existing language models for tons of downstream tasks that um, the language that they were trained on actually transfers really well to. So some of those, you know, you have your BART, your BERT, your Ernie, GPT, T5, all those uh, types of models, if you've heard those names over the past couple of years. So the current standard in using these language models is kind of um, has to do with basically what I described first. You take your language model and train it over a very large amount of text, think Wikipedia or all of Reddit or something like that. And this language model is being trained for some kind of either next token prediction or masked token prediction. Um, we don't have to get too into the weeds there, but basically what it's doing is it's just taking the text as is and it's learning to predict um, other aspects about the same text. So this doesn't have the need for human labels to get these really strong, powerful language models that um, ideally are absorbing some characteristics of natural language. So um, the way that a lot of people use these models in practice is that they're able to take the language model that was trained over all that data and then uh, attach a task specific or task head classifier at the end of that language model. And this classifier can be something like just a feed forward neural network that classifies spam or not spam as shown here in the example, or it can be something a little bit more complicated that uh, is just used to, for example, do mach machine translation and has a few more um, bells and whistles on top of that. But so basically the premise is that we take the encoder of the language model and then chop off the decoder and put our own version um, of a task head specific thing at the end there. Now, this is great because first it enables that we get transfer learning um, in a lot of downstream applications. And so this kind of gives us the model knowledge that it was the all the language characteristics that the model learned. We kind of get those for free when we apply them to a simpler or smaller task. Um, which is known as transfer learning. We also have a pretty standardized and fairly straightforward way of doing this task head uh, classifier work. This is largely thanks to folks over at Hugging Face. Their um, repository has just been incredible and really helps people move forward in uh, implementing these models and kind of experimenting with them as well. However, so that leads us to some of the cons. So as I said before, we take the encoder of the language model and then we kind of just chop off whatever decoder framework that model uses. So first we actually lose out on all of the knowledge learned by that decoder or any latent space representations um, that it learns within its weights. Second, we also lose out on any mapping. So if I'm applying my uh, language model to a sentiment classification problem, we actually lose out on any knowledge about the task labels in that sentiment classification problem, because when we slap on a new task head specific uh, dense neural network, basically what we're doing is we 
uh, have to reinitialize that new network with fresh weights, and it doesn't know anything about what the class labels actually represent. So we lose any uh, semantic meaning that there was in those task labels from the model. And then finally, this actually still has a bit of supervision costs because like I said, we come in with fresh weights on that task head classifier. And so we actually still need a good amount of data to be able to train that specific classifier and also maybe fully relearn the weights for some of the other parts of the model. Now, in order to address a lot of these issues, a new kind of paradigm has popped up called prompting. So what prompting is, is basically instead of cutting off the decoder aspect of the language model, we want to just leave that whole architecture as is. So this was really brought to light by the GPT-3 paper, which is called Language Models Are Few Shot Learners. And I would definitely recommend, although it is a bit of a bit of a commitment. Um, but so on the right, this is a figure lifted from that paper. And so the point of prompting is that instead of treating our language model as the input to a classifier, what we're going to do is we're actually just going to keep it as a language model. And then hopefully, um, if we give it the right natural language context, it will give us what we want um, to fulfill our task, whatever that may be, either classification or machine translation, as pictured here, or uh, natural entity recognition, <clears throat> excuse me, um, named entity recognition, and so on. So on the right, you can see that basically the input to the model in uh, this zero shot setting, and I'll get into the difference between zero and few shot in a moment, but the input to the model is basically we say, okay, I want you to translate English to French, and then we say cheese and give it an arrow. So hopefully the model can pick up that, okay, it now wants to give a French, tra French translation. Now this might not be enough because the model might still be kind of confused. Like what does the arrow mean? Has it seen enough arrows in its training to know what to do from that? What's helpful here is to actually give the model a few examples. So if you see the few shot case, this is still using GPT-3. What the prompt becomes is that we actually still do the translate English to French. We wanna frame what task we're trying to do. And then we give a few examples of um, English to French translations below before asking the model to then complete the next prompt. So hopefully it kind of picks up on what the next step should be. Um, and one of the really nice parts about this is that this allows us to take advantage of existing relations between our examples and any label space that we might care about when running um, classification tasks. So when is prompting useful? Prompting is actually really useful in a few key circumstances. So the first main one is that when our number of training examples is low, prompting actually outperforms the task head classification in some of these really large language models. So if you look at the graph, um, the blue line represents the largest language model at 175 billion parameters. The red and green um, both represent smaller models. But you can see in actually every case that the solid line representing prompting um, outperforms the dotted line, which represents the kind of standard way of doing it right now of task head classification, all the way up till um, in GPT-3, it's only till about eight uh, training examples. But for the other two, it's around nine or uh, probably 20 or 30 in the lowest one for 1.3 billion parameters. But so what this shows us is that prompting kind of picks up on what the label space is trying to convey at the start and needs less labeled examples to get up to some baseline accuracy. Um, and the other case when prompting is really useful is if your label space contains encoded information. So what this kind of means is that if you frame your classification task, so the example I'm giving is if we're classifying sentiment, if you frame that sentiment to a human as I'm going to give you this quote, this movie was incredible, and then I give you two options, positive or negative. You're aware of which the answer should be. So we select positive because we have the context given those uh, that label space. However, if I give this, this other example to a human, this movie was incredible, and then ask them choose zero or one, they're not going to know right away what that means. So they'll have to probably see a few training examples to then extrapolate their decision to other examples. And even then still might not be entirely sure. So um, this is kind of the same premise when we apply this to language models is that if our label space contains meaningful semantic information, we want to be able to encode that in the model um, classification task. And 
also one of the final parts about um, when prompting is useful is that any, anywhere where there's additional domain knowledge that can be imparted and make the task more successful is really key. And so this kind of ties into weak supervision because this is an exciting place where we can inject domain and subject matter knowledge into a topic and the language model can then hopefully absorb that knowledge and use it to um, improve its performance. So now I'm gonna dive into some of the methods around prompting and just give an overview of uh, some of the things that this paper talks about, which is, uh, like I said, a survey over just tons and tons of different activity in the field. Um, so bear with me if it gets a little technical, feel free to not uh, pay attention too closely to some of the things like the notation, but um, I'm just gonna give an overview of a few of the properties of the paper. So um, first and foremost, to start your classification task, you're gonna want two things, your input and output. So um, sentiment is a really co common example here because it uh, explains a lot of these concepts easily, but this task would be a sentiment classification task. So your input is gonna be a string of text, I love this movie, your output is going to be a Y label, which corresponds to the plus plus class, which is very positive in, excuse me, in semantic terms. So then uh, the next thing you're gonna wanna need is a prompting function. After that, you're gonna need uh, the output of that prompting function, which they call X prime. You're gonna want a filled prompt and an answered prompt. Um, and then finally, you're gonna want an answer. So don't worry about absorbing this, this um, I won't, be adhering too closely to this, but it's just helpful context in case some of these terms come back up in the future. So here are some examples of using prompts for classification tasks. So that top one, our favorite sentiment example is you have an input X, which is called, which says, I love this movie. Next, you have a template, which is basically what consists of your prompt. So the template has a slot for the example, which is denoted by the X in brackets, and it has a slot for a potential answer, which is denoted by the Z in brackets. So um, a list of answers exists on the right. So you have great or fantastic or probably bad, terrible, and just a bunch of options to choose from. And basically what the prompted model will do is it will take um, the, the X prime from the previous example, which is a, a um, template that has had the input X filled in. So the template will look like, I love this movie, period, this movie is, and then still have that room for the answer. And then it'll iterate over every single answer and choose what the language model sees as the most probable outcome. Um, and so that's kind of the typical way to do the, not typical, that's the most simple way to do it for classification tasks. Um, but you can also extend this to some other task types. So. We can do this for aspect sentiment. So we could have our prompts and it will say, it basically we have our example fed in and then in our prompt, we specifically ask about the aspect that we care about. So we say, what about service? Because that's the aspect that we care about classifying sentiment for. We can all, <clears throat> excuse me. We can also do this for text pair, text pair classification. So in this example, we actually have two input slots for X in our prompt. So the first one is we say we want the first part to be a question. So this will be entailment. Um, and then our answer is either this does entail something or it doesn't entail something. So that's why the options for Z are yes or no. Basically, we're saying, does X1 lead to someone saying yes, in fact, this is the case for X2, or does it lead to someone saying no, actually X2, um, something like that. Then. Named entity recognition also feeds into this with uh, putting two examples in the same prompt. And then we also finally have text generation. So these are a little bit more straightforward in that the Z um, in brackets right there represents just an open-ended string that can be generated by our language model. These are probably a little bit less novel than prompting, but still um, fall under the category of what these methods hope to do, which is um, basically get the language model into some state where it's ready to give us our desired output. Now I'm going to go over some design components for the actually making a prompted prediction. And so here are going to be the key components that you need to specify in order to use language model prompting for your prediction. So first you're going to want to select a pre-trained model. 
So we assume that you're already starting with the basic components for conducting a standard classification task. So that's going to be a set of examples, which would be your X, which are for inference and or training, a label space that consists of all possible values of Y, and optionally a set of labels from those Ys if you are going to be training this task. But so first you select your pre-trained language model. And so this is going to be one of like BERT, GPT-3, um, BART, and it, whatever language model you select comes with some design considerations that we will go over later. But just know that this is an important part of what domain knowledge is encoded in the model already and what the predictions are going to look like from that model. Next, you're going to want to define a prompting function. So the prompt function is basically those templates you saw earlier and any way of combining the text with that template is going to be how your prompting function looks. You're also going to want to define a way to select the best filled prompt. So if you look uh, on the right, a filled prompt is where you already give um, an example into your prompt and you also give it a potential answer. And so because there's only you're only giving it one potential answer and there's many different answers that you can um, provide, you're going to want to find a way to select what your language model thinks is the best filled prompt. So in the simple case, this just looks like an argmax function over all possible uh, filled prompts for each answer. But in some cases, your answer space is just really large and you actually need to use something like a sampling method to find uh, what you think are the best prompts. Next, you're going to define an answer space. And so what this answer space is, is um, again, a place where domain knowledge is actually encoded, but it's a list of all possible values for Z. And so this is important because um, what it can help with is it basically allows you to have a mapping from your uh, label space to something that the language model can understand. And so that's number five is once you have your answer space, you're going to want to define a mapping from that answer space back to the label space. So basically going from Z to Y. And then finally, um, if you do intend on using a few shot prompted uh, predictor, you're also going to want to define a method to train your model for this. And it looks like we have a question. Um, the idea of the influence of formatting your prompts will have on the quality of the output, for example, carriage returns. Uh, that's a great question. Definitely depends on the language model. Some of the stronger ones um, seem to kind of ignore some of that, but it that that is definitely an ongoing area of research. Um, one that I don't have a ton of familiarity with, but hopefully that answers your question is that it's like definitely something people are considering. Um, and it seems like a lot of language specific things actually at, uh, affect these language models. Although I will, I will actually say that um, some special characters are filtered out just in the pre-processing pre -processing step. So it, it, your tokenizer also will play a role in um, what happens there. Um, okay, and cool. So the, these are the seven, um, these are kind of like the seven things that you have to figure out if you're gonna wanna use your model for prompting, or sorry, six. Um, and so, these can be broken down slightly further into sections that correspond to chapters three, four, five, and six from the paper. Um, so first, or sorry, three, four, five, and seven. Um, so first, your selection of your pre-trained language model. So this, the biggest impact here is actually how the language model was pre-trained and what type of um, decoding that model does. Next, um, the steps two and three with the prompt function and uh, selecting the best filled prompt. This can be known kind of as prompt engineering, and there are a lot of different methods for um, investigating these, uh, these um, open areas. Next, we have answer engineering, which uh, takes care of both defining the answer space and defining the mapping from the answer space to the label space. Um, and so this kind of more has to deal with encoding the uh, knowledge or encoding your label space into a model readable format. Um, and finally, we have prompted training strategies, which is chapter seven in the paper. We won't have time to go over this, but this is definitely a big design consideration if you're interested in doing the few shot um, case as opposed to just zero shot, because you're going to want to figure out how you either update the weights of your language model via these prompts 
or how you want to provide um, examples in context to the language model. Also um, important to note that prompt engineering and answer engineering are kind of the key ways that we can incorporate weak supervision into the uh, language model prompting. So I will get a little bit more into those uh, in a moment. So it looks like there's another question. Oh wait, I can click this answer live button. It looks like uh, how would you? How would I figure out the best way to format a timestamp? That is a great question, and I think right now what you would do is you would want to kind of try a few different formats and then see which one gives you the best performance on a validation set. Um, there, I actually haven't read anything that's timestamp specific yet. Um, so I might not be the best, I'm definitely not the best person to answer that question. But as far as a lot of these prompts and answer engineering strategies, uh, it seems to be that, <clears throat> excuse me, seems to be that the best thing people are doing in the research field is just kind of trying a bunch of things and seeing what sticks. Um, okay, so the first section is selecting the pre-trained model. So, um, Basically, the pre-training objective has a pretty significant impact on how your uh, language model is going to be for use with prompted prediction. So there's a few different pre-training objectives that these language models are trained with. So the first one, this is kind of the most simple, is next token prediction. And I guess when I say simple, the most straightforward and easy to understand. So Next token prediction is basically we have the previous, given all the previous words in context, we just want to predict the next word. So this would be um, in the classic case of like a variational autoencoder via an LSTM from like 2017 or 2018. Basically what you're doing is you're just predicting the next token in the sequence, giving all the previous tokens in the sequence. Now with transformers, it uh, kind of gets to the same place, but this is a um, pretty, classic method of doing things. Um, so one of the reasons that these pre-training objectives are so important for prompting considerations is that these are gonna affect the way that the types of prompts that we can actually give the model and the ways that we can actually incorporate answers into those prompts. So another um, pre-training objective that's pretty popular is masked token prediction. So instead of just predicting the next token given all the previous tokens, some language models actually predict uh, any masked tokens within the input given all the surrounding context. So uh, example language models that do these would be BERT or Roberta, um, and obviously distill BERT as well. Next, um, this is a pre-training method that actually doesn't necessarily pre-train a language model, but can still be helpful for um, prompted classification tasks. So this would be training an entailment model. And so entailment is the task of trying that given two statements, you want to um, classify whether these statements entail each other, contradict each other, or are neutral, which means they have no relation to each other. And so the example given right here is a black race car starts up in front of a crowd of people is the premise. So the hypothesis is either entailed, contradicted, or neutral given the premise. So the hypothesis is that a man is driving down a lonely road. So since we saw a crowd of people in the premise, we actually know this is a contradiction. So a natural language inference model, um, which is basically learning to classify these entailment um, functions, will say that this uh, will hopefully learn enough of these uh, pairwise examples to know that um, in general, what entails something and what doesn't. So what's helpful here when we use it with um, prompted prediction is that I can give an entailment model something like a an example, my example X. So in the sentiment case, I love the movie, period. And then I can give it an entailment prompt, which would be something like this example means that uh, or the movie was and then my possible answers could be good, bad or OK. And ideally, um, I run that I run those two. Um, I run the premise as the example. I run the hypothesis as this movie was good, bad, or okay. So I run it once for each of those in conjunction with the premise. And then the model should give me an entailment contradiction or neutral score. And so I look at the answer that achieves the highest entailment score out of those three. And basically that tells me what the model um, thinks to be the best 
answer. And so these entailment models may seem a little tangential, but they actually have shown um, better performance in the zero shot setting. And they are actually what Hugging Face uses as the default for zero shot classification. Um, so that there's also, there's a lot of other things that go into model selection, but in the interest of time, I kind of just showed the um, pre-training objective. If you want a deeper look, look at chapter three of the paper. But so next I'll get into prompt engineering. And so prompt engineering defi or, uh, outlines those two steps of define a prompt function and defining the best way to select the prompts given a bunch of filled prompts. And so prompt engineering has a couple of different ways to go about it. So the most straightforward way is to simply have humans craft manual templates for your prompt. Well, excuse me. While this does inject researcher bias into evaluations, it's also a great launching point for integrating prompting methods into weak supervision. So basically, in the example I just showed, if we have two manual templates for a certain task, we'd have a generic one, which is just your example, period. This example is about potential answer. Now, if we have a subject matter expert instead say something like, Given our example, a patient is likely to experience answer, and I realize this isn't actually a subject matter expert, because I'm sure a doctor would know more things uh, to put in that prompt. But in general, tailoring the prompt to be more task specific should um, and has been shown to help uh, performance in classification tasks. So this would be an area that is definitely actively being researched, but is also an area that weak supervision can really slot in here to help um, uh, improve with the prompting process. Um, another thing to note here is that one of the popular strategies right now that um, people are using with prompting is to ensemble a bunch of different prompts together. And that's something that kind of has direct ties to weak supervision. Um, so that instead of ensembling a bunch of prompts, you could treat a bunch of prompts as labeling functions and find uh, basically like share the weak supervision aspect of it and improve performance that way. But I won't dive too far into that because that could be a whole talk on its own. Um, so that was kind of the manual templates approach. There's also been a push for automated templates. So since the area is very new, there's definitely a lot of interesting ideas at how to automatically generate these prompt templates. Um, the paper covers a lot of them and uh, I'm not gonna dive into the specifics, but I'd recommend checking it out. These range from things like prompt mining, which uh, you're given a training set of X and Y pairs. It will discover prompts within a really large corpus like Wikitext uh, by finding connector words between that X and Y. So what that would look like is if my prompt was, uh, or my training examples were, this movie is uh, good and then my Y is great. Or sorry, this movie is and then, sorry. Uh, let me backtrack. If the example input pairs were um, something like, I love this movie, and then your example uh, label is great, then you would find some kind of connector words between, I love this movie, this movie was great in your um, corpus. And so that could be one way to gen automatically generate prompt templates. Another could be something like, or another form of automated templates are actually things like continuous or soft prompts, which um, don't involve actually learning the natural language representation of the prompts at all. And they actually just embed them directly in the latent space of the model um, and then combine them with the uh, each example in turn and each potential answer. So there's definitely a lot of like fun and exciting research in this area. Um, and it has a lot of potential for people to find like new ways to use these prompts uh, better. Um, and that takes us to answer engineering, which is the third of the four kind of like big buckets that I showed you. And so answer engineering has to deal with defining the answer space and defining a mapping from the answer space to the label space. So, um, oops, sorry. So the first thing that you're gonna want for your answer space is to figure out what shape that space is. And what I mean by shape is how um, does the answer look? Is it the form of a single token, like in our sentiment example? Is it the form of a span of tokens, so where we could have multi-word answers? Or is it the form of open-ended text, like in our TLDR or uh, machine translation examples? 
So these are all important design considerations based that based on your task, you're going to want to um, make sure you figure out. The single token example works the best for kind of simplicity of implementation and also um, kind of like constrains your search space a lot. If you do a span of tokens, you'll either need a language model that um, can input or can predict a span of tokens in a single mask location, or you're going to need to do something like uh, Markov chain um, prediction in a certain spot at the end of your uh, prompt. So that can get a lot more complicated than just the single token space. Open-ended text is kind of also a little straightforward in that a lot of um, language models right now are just uh, support encoder to decoder um, <clears throat> strategies. And the, this open-ended text is also another common answer shape. Um, and then aside from the shape, you're also going, going to want to um, consider the answer space. So this one actually is pretty important for how the prompting methods work with the language model. In my own experience, I found this to be actually the most critical step in uh, mapping your label, or it has to do with mapping the label space to, uh, mapping the label space to something the language model can understand. So mapping between the answer space and the label space. But um, this is definitely where I see the biggest difference between performance in prompting methods from my own uh, experimentation. And so the answer space can be uh, found via manual design. So you could just make it a one-to-one -one mapping. So for our sentiment example, you could have um, five classes. So you could either call these classes zero, one, two, three, four, or you could call them plus, 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 zero, minus, minus, minus. And so that would be your label space. And then you're going to want to map it into the answer space of excellent, good, okay, bad, terrible. So this one-to-one -one mapping means that each answer maps up with each with one label. And this uh, definitely, as far as implementation goes, is pretty straightforward to implement. But we can also make things a little bit more complicated, but also um, hopefully more performant if we actually do a one-to-many mapping. So first uh, size, I just kind of condensed the sentiment example. But if we have three classes, positive, neutral, negative, um, in our label space, this can map to where we have sets of answers for each class. So the good, the positive class could map to good, excellent, great, neutral could map to okay, fine, and negative could map to terrible, bad, et cetera. And so what this then opens up is how do we map the answer, the best answer chosen from our prompt back into the label space? And there's a bunch of different methods for doing that. One of the most common is just find the um, best uh, answer out of all of the potential candidates and then uh, map that back to the label that it corresponds to. But like I said, this is definitely an open area of research and kind of it's kind of like anything goes at this point. So if you find something that works, uh, good for you and just keep doing it. Um, and then there are actually also ways to automatedly search over the answer space, just like there are for the um, prompting prompt engineering. And so these can be things like having uh, starting with either your existing label space or some initial human generated, manually generated labels or uh, answer space, and then paraphrasing it into a bunch of different answers. Um, or you could do something else like, uh, sorry, lost my notes here. Um, or you could do something else like a prune and search approach where you basically have a ton of potential answer candidates and then you prune them into possible uh, ones that the model thinks are possible via the uh, weights of the model. But yeah, so there's a lot of work going on in just kind of narrowing down what these techniques are and which ones work and which don't. But it's definitely a really um, fun area of research, honestly, because you can see a lot of kind of crazy things happen that you weren't expecting. Um, oh, and one thing I forgot to note here is that the manual design of the answer space is also another great place to encode subject matter knowledge. So this is a really good tie into weak supervision in that our, um, if you choose a one-to-one -one mapping or a one-to-many mapping, manually encoding what the mappings should be for those uh, answer keys is um, something that would greatly work with weak supervision in being able to kind of encode domain knowledge to weakly supervise the um, end model. 
And yeah, so that brings us to the conclusion. So my first point that I hope you took away is that prompting is a really fun new paradigm. And what's nice is that if you are interested, it's, I wouldn't say fairly easy to get going, but it's definitely not, um, it's not super inhibited to get started. So you can just download a model from Hugging Face and just start using either the masked LM or the entailment zero shot uh, models or pipelines. And that will kind of just let you get going from there. And so there's definitely a lot of certain conditions where prompting improves over the current task head practice. And it's really exciting to see uh, these conditions either growing or that improvement margin um, expanding based on people digging into this and seeing what works and what doesn't. And also just the fact that there's so much to explore makes it uh, really open-ended and really fun. And then domain knowledge can be injected in a couple places in both prompt engineering and answer engineering. And this is huge for applying weak supervision to prompting and vice versa in that we can hopefully get a signal boost from uh, using those methods. But yeah, um, thank you for the talk and or for listening. And that's all I've got today. So questions, it looks like there's one uh, question I'll get to first. Any thoughts on filtering out really bad answers, i.e. ham versus spam compared to pulling, putting all answers, for example, in your training split and applying labeling functions to it? Um, that's a really good question. So that's actually something we've run into on the research side. And I would say right now, the consideration, or right now, it looks like the best way to do it is to pull out the bad answers first, because even with pruning methods, there still might be a bit of a performance hit. Um, but the your it seems like your intuition is definitely right in the fact that like you're thinking about it. So I would say not including them in the first place is definitely better. But um, if you get a good pruning method, it might not matter. Or also thresholding uh, matters a lot too, because these prompting functions will give you a uh, logit as the output. And so you can threshold that logit based on how you're feel, how confident you're feeling about your answers. Um, okay. And then another question, can you speak more to how weak supervision can be used in answer engineering? I've read that null prompts can be just as effective as manually written prompts. So is it worth it to even spend time engineering prompts? Honestly, in my uh, experience, I haven't found prompts to be that effective. I'm sure, or uh, prompt engineering to have that much of a performance um, toggle. Actually, okay, let me let me backtrack that. I found prompt engineering to, like there's ways that you can get it into bigger error modes. So your choice of prompt could have a bad effect, but it seems like the average is kind of the upper bar as well. So um, hopefully that wasn't too confusing, but basically I'm agreeing that I don't think it's worth spending too much time engineering the prompts in, um, in, the, in the simple cases. That's not like, that's not saying that really domain specific data sets, engineering the prompt won't have a really high effect, but it definitely feels like to me, answer engineering is where the domain knowledge matters the most and um, really helps out the most. So I guess short answer to your question, and in my opinion, no, it's not worth it to spend time engineering prompts. Um, any other questions? All right. Similar to training subject matter experts to write labeling functions, how do you feel about training them to write prompts? That's a great question. Um, I think if prompts are shown to be effective in that they actually have a measurable performance impact, I think it could be worth it. But um, like the previous question kind of alluded to, if they don't have a performance impact, I don't think it's worth it. And we can just focus on the answer engineering side, which can be a lot more kind of like SME friendly. Fantastic, Ryan. So thank you so much, Ryan, for the fantastic talk and to everyone who joined today. Um, we'll be recording this ML whiteboard and we'll be posting on our YouTube channel. So please stay tuned to our social and you'll, you'll, you'll see it. You will be seeing it coming. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, guys.